Subtle skills, big results. Welcome to the Ninja Selling Podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to the Ninja Selling Podcast. Garrett and Matt, as always, we're here. Before we jump into today's topic, which is all about selling, well, I mean, it is the Ninja Selling Podcast, but just to give you a little bit of a hook there that's going to be fun to talk about, join our community, right? Ninja Selling Facebook podcast. I messed that one up. Go to facebook.com slash group slash the ninja selling podcast. That's where our community resides on Facebook. Answer the questions. For those of you who have invited people in, or if you've requested to be in and you're not in there, we have over 800 people sitting in like the waiting room, Garrett, that just haven't answered any of the membership questions. And the reason why we ask you to ask those, even if I can look at your profile and see that a real person is one, it takes a lot of time to review all that stuff. And two, if you answer the questions, we know that it wasn't an accident that you clicked it. There wasn't like a robot or something. Cause every now and then you get these fake Facebook profiles that look like real people and then they get in there and try to sell something. So please answer the questions if you haven't, or if you've invited people and they're not in there, just let them know. Hey, by the way, if you answer the questions, that'd be great. So Garrett, I could have done that better, by the way. You butchered that up. I did. I did. I recovered. You did. It was a nice recovery. You did You did just fine. Yeah. Yeah. So good morning to you. Thank you. Good morning to you also. You ready to talk about selling? I am. This kind of, Matt, came up, I think, for the two of us is just we were kind of kicking around. What is it that we're really selling? And I think uh, real estate's an interesting one for me because I've stepped back many times going like, what are we really selling? And I think a lot of people get confused on the actual product of what's being sold. And the more we started talking about it, the more we were like, okay, this is a selling moment for, let's say, a listing agent. This is a selling out agent moment for a buyer's agent. These are all the selling moments that kind of come up through this process. But at the end of the day, are you really a salesperson? Are you advisor? Are you a guide helping people to get from point A to point B? And then it, this turned into an interesting conversation that we're like, yes, we should talk about this. And the answer was yes to all of those things. It's like, oh, all of them. <laughs> yes. I think, Garrett, it starts with, you know, the typical, right? Real estate agents say, hey, what do you do? Oh, I sell homes. But first and foremost, you don't because you can't sell homes until you sell your service. You cannot sell homes until you sell yourself and actually have homes to sell, <laughs> right? And that's on the listing side if we get very specific in terms of how we want to qualify selling. But First and foremost, this is a service-based business. This is a people-based business. And this is where this got interesting, Matt, because we were starting to talk about like, well, we have people out there that are like, well, I don't understand why so-and-so is more successful than me. I don't understand why so-and-so has more sales than I do. And there is a common thread there of have your clients bought you. Like before you ever get a chance to sell a house, before you ever chance to you know put something under contract, how many people have actually bought you with what your value is and what you bring to the table and the skill sets that you have that's going to help them be successful in their world? And I think it's a huge missing piece that a lot of people miss the boat on is that they're constantly looking there. It's like, I got to make another home sale. I got to make another home sale. I, I need more people to work with. I don't understand. I got my hot, my warm list, and I'm focusing on all these people, but so-and-so just used somebody else. And I ah, ah. Like, why did they go use somebody else? Because they bought somebody else. They literally saw the value in somebody else, be it personality-wise, and they decided to go buy a different product. It has nothing to do with selling a house up front. Absolutely. And I think it is the first place that a lot of people stumble, right? We can go down a path of knowing your value, how you do explain your value proposition, all of these things that contribute to how do you sell yourself as a service? How do you sell your brokerage as a service? And that the, going back to the what if episode, right? Like what if brokerages actually helped the agents have that service that is saleable so that the agent has more to stand on than just themselves as a service to sell? And there are brokerages out there, by the way, that do that. That's the beauty of some that are very appealing to brand new brokers in the industry is it allows them to be able to come in and plug and play and be like, here, we've got all the stuff here to help you sell yourself to get your platform set up. Or there's others, and there's no, I'm not knocking them either, that are like, you do your own thing. We're going to sit here. We'll hold your license. You figure out your business and go run with it. 
everybody needs different things at different times in their business career. No doubt. So Garrett, selling yourself as a service, I kind of look at, to make it easy, there's two stages of this. There is the relationship building stage and showing just overall value of of you. And that's the core of Ninja. That's the core of what we talk to people about. If you build strong relationships, that is step one in selling yourself as a service because people want to know, like, and trust you. And then the next step is to be in flow with you. But then it's what is the value add of your service as a realtor, right? How does this make someone's life easier? And if you think about all the different products that we're put in front of every day that are service products, take software as a service, for example, SaaS products, right? Think about project management tools, CRMs, all of these things. The pitch is these things will make your life easier so that your business gets better. Marketing tools. The pitch is this is going to help you attract more customers so you can have more business, right? There is always a very clearly defined value proposition of what that service will do for you. And this is something that we should work on as real estate agents, making sure that our service is clear in terms of how it's going to provide value to whether it's a buyer or a seller. I had an epiphany while you're sitting here talking, which is if your number one sales position is on your service, I help people buy and sell homes. That's my job. And I've never thought of it this way, but that's the fastest way to turn into a transactional based real estate agent because you're constantly sitting there and saying, here's my service and I need to find the next person that needs to buy or sell a house. Hey, do you need to buy or sell a house? Matt, do you need to buy or sell a house right now? You don't? Okay, good. I'm going to go over here. Sarah, do you need to buy or sell a house right now? No. Nope. Okay, I'm going to go over here then. I'm going to go look at that. Or you also commoditize yourself too. Yes. And I love that you broke this down because it's true into two sections, which is the relationship side of it and the service side of it. And this is what I've watched for people with for years is when you can sell both sides of this. And then when we say sell, I don't mean in the creepy version of sell where it's like, oh, I'm being sold right now. Totally different. Well, good salespeople, the other side never knows they're being sold, right? You never know that there's a sale actually happening if it's being done right. Like that's really the way it should be happening, which then somebody on the relationship side just starts building more and more confidence and trust and understanding of who you are and what you're about and that your heart is in it for them and the bigger picture. And then you've got this crazy, awesome service on the backside that's going to help it be smooth, seamless. They're going to be protected. You're going to help them achieve their dreams and their goals. And when you start to combine these two, this is where we see miracles happen in people's businesses. But it's not just selling homes. That sounds really good. What I like about these two parts, and this is where a lot of agents get frustrated, is an exceptional service can actually override a relationship and vice versa, depending on the weight of each, right? You have a really good friend. Oh man, we're such good friends. Why didn't they use me as a real estate agent? Well, maybe because they weren't clear on the great value that your service brings, but this other agent came in and just offered an outstanding value. So the relationship just didn't matter that much anymore because when people want to transact, when they want to do something, they also want to make sure that all of the things are being taken care of. And that will override a good relationship if there is a massive difference in the service. Now, if the services seem the same, the relationship will win all the time, right? And that's why it's like, why not build the relationship first? Because if there's a, a tie or a close point of competition on the service, likely the relationship will win out on that one, right? You think about it, Matt, it's a really great point is because everybody's been in a, a situation with a client. Most of you have been in a situation with a client where we think that if that person were to sell, they're going to use us. They end up not using us. And after you talk to them, they're like, we have to use her. She's a family friend. This was where the relationship wins out over service. Like she's a close family friend. She does all of our real estate. They might even say, I actually think you're a better real estate agent. But not enough to override that relationship. You can still override those relationships. It's possible. But the difference in the level of service has to be so abundantly clear that they go that path. And this is one of the hardest things to do because you're not always given the venue to sell your service, so to speak, right? If you don't get invited in for the interview, you didn't have that opportunity to 
really lay it on. So we have to figure out how do we quote sell or describe the value proposition of our service outside that venue as well. So let me throw this variable into the equation. Relationship, let's say, can outweigh service. And I use the example of like, well, we had to use her. She's a lifelong friend. She does our family's real estate, whatever that might look like. What if we step back for a second, though, and say, well, what if the business isn't based on the relationship? How am I trying to say this? I'm thinking about the referrals. This is where some people get like into that, like, well, you know, now we can't use her. She's never, a, you know, a God, my brain is like lost in loops right now. Matt, help me out. Jeez. So going to the next level of attracting referrals out, right? So there's selling, quote unquote, to do business with the people in front of you when we're in those moments. And then there is people actually referring things. And this comes down to why do people refer? You know why people refer, right, Garrett? Oh, yeah, because, well, at the end of the day, it makes them look good. Exactly, right? So if they know that the sister, she's good, she's okay, but I just don't know if I refer her to my friend over here, she's going to make me look good. But I know that if I refer Garrett, he's going to make me look good. So I'll use my sister because I can handle it, but I'm going to refer Garrett. This is where I was going back to is being strong in both of these categories may not win over that relationship in that moment in time, but the two combined will win the referral, I think, almost every time. Yes, absolutely. That's what I was trying to say. My goodness, Matt, thanks for bringing me around. Apologize, everybody out there. It's early. No problem. No problem. But this is also why it's important to make sure that we are finding ways to display our value of our service outside the venue, because that also helps attract referrals. Like If we're not explaining, you, you think about it, right? Real estate agents don't have easy social proof. Okay, we have testimonials, but that's if people are going and reading them, which if they're not researching you, they're not reading them. But if I drive by a restaurant every day and there's always a line out the door, even if I don't eat there, I'm like, I know that restaurant must be good because I can see it. So when people are asking, hey, what's a good restaurant? I'd be like, oh, Jack's down the street. It's always packed. It's a great place. I'm confident that I'm probably going to look good because someone's going to go there. And just based on the fact that they're packed, they'll probably have a good experience because they'll think that they must have a good experience because everybody else is there having a good experience. 99 soup day is what it was. 99 cent soup day. <laughs> So I got the comfort in knowing that Jack's restaurant is going to make me look good. People don't see other people lined up to see their real estate agent. And this is why I think events are very important because you can build that social proof because you actually have people together interacting, talking about how great it was working with Garrett. So figuring out how to build social proof is part of that, quote, sales process of displaying your value and sharing that value so that with that when people do want to make the decision of bringing you in to then actually pitch for the business. You're part of that, right? No, it makes total sense. So I think again, as we're, as we're starting off here and talking about this whole idea of sales and real estate, I think, you know, Matt to kind of like, and I want to go down some other parts of this, but up front, we need to remember that them buying us as part of the sales process, us providing enough value so that they're like, I choose to buy Matt Benelli's skill set, energy, whatnot, as we move forward here. They're buying your service. They're buying your relationship and your energy. And I think that that's the first sale that's going to come up to be. And a lot of it's going to happen way before you ever talk real estate with them, at least their own personal real estate. And this is where like ninja selling core fundamentals is based on. And a lot of people go like, well, why am I talking with these people that they're not even like, thinking about buying or selling? Why am I giving energy to these people that aren't even thinking about buying or selling real estate? Because it's a package. It's a whole package of what your value is. I'll give you a quick story to wrap this section up and we can move on to the next is just talking to an agent yesterday and he's just been really investing in this relationship that he has just because he likes this person and everything. And he happened to go down a path with this gentleman and they really connected. And the next week after he got back from vacation, four referrals put into his lap. Guy was, runs a company, had new employees moving to town, had already an agent that he typically worked with, but the relationship got stronger over here. And he was like, hey, do you think you can handle all four of these people? Yeah, sure. Like that's massive, right? <laughs> so that's how it works. Well, it's like, how many of those do you need a year to transform your business? 
I mean, that's four sales right there. I mean, I mean, depending on your marketplace, like you could have a handful of those and all of a sudden you've got a completely different year than you've ever had. Yeah. And so there you go. What's next? We were talking about when you look at from a buyer's agent to a listing agent, what are your different points of, of selling that we have to do? And this kind of came up a little bit, Matt, because we're looking at like skill sets that people have right now and listing agents that really have not had to have their skill sets too sharp in the sales world here for a while. And we're watching agents that are going, uh-oh, I actually need to get my skills back up. I need to figure out how to talk with my sellers again. I need to figure out how to launch a listing. I had somebody bring that up to me. Like, I actually have to like launch a listing. And I'm like, you haven't been launching. Okay, let's back up for a second. And then buyers right now, I think when you look at like being a salesperson as a buyer's agent, not buyers, but as a buyer's agent, like the skill set, I compared it to you, Matt, earlier of me in a past life when I used to sell cars and I was really good at selling used cars. I'm going to toot my own horn here for a second, but I was really good at it. It was interesting because you'd watch somebody walk onto a lot. They'd come into your, into your dealership and most people have a very particular idea of like, well, this is kind of what I want. I want something that maybe is this color. I want something with leather. I want something with an automatic transmission. I want something with this. And the problem on a used car lot is that you can't order one from the factory. <laughs> we got what we got. And I need to help figure out what all these cars are to you instead of what they're not to you. I can very easily see we don't have a red car in the lot. I know you want a red car. I can very easily see that everything we have here is cloth interior. I can very easily see that, well, yeah, they're all manuals also. Sounds like a place I'd want to shop if they're all manuals. Let's do it. It's a great car lot. But for me to be a successful salesperson, it's not selling somebody or convincing them to buy something they didn't want. It's finding something here that's available that actually makes them go, that could work that actually works for me. Like I didn't look at it from that way. And I think as a buyer's agent, being a guide, being an advisor, it's helping people look at all the different angles to be able to go like, well, I didn't think about that, but this could actually solve my situation that I'm in and could make my life better by having this thing. Out of the time we just came through, the best buyer's agents that I saw, the ones that were writing offers on homes that maybe a lot of people would have overlooked or stepped around were really good at helping out their clients in that situation. Being able to see opportunities and properties that a lot of were walking in and going like, nope, doesn't have leather, doesn't have an automatic transmission. They're not red, not our house. Let's move along. And sometimes it's good to stop and be like, but wait, 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 wait. Let's talk about this for a second. Look, let's look at this from this angle and let's look at it from this angle. And it's not selling, like it's not the creepy salesperson going like, I'm going to convince them. Why? And I think this is the biggest difference I see between a buyer's agent and a listing agent is a buyer's agent's job is not to sell that house. Buyer's agent's job, in my opinion, is to be an exceptional guide and purchase advisor in a way that helps that buyer get to where they want to go, right? And Part of that is asking those buyers tough questions, getting them to think a little bit differently, sometimes broadening their vision and then sometimes narrowing their vision to help them achieve the underlying goal. You know, in the case of if you had a buying advisor as part of helping you buy a car, understanding that like, well, we need to make sure we get a car that works perfectly for the family. And how can we get around certain challenges? Well, you know, the cloth seats are really tough, but you know what? Garrett, do you think you could throw in some of these really amazing seat covers that you have over here that might help? get us over that hurdle of the type of interior we have here. Yeah, we can make that happen. They're lamb's wool. Is that okay? Sounds great. Remember those? Oh, man. You don't see those anymore. They get so dirty. Whatever happened to lamb's wool seat covers? Like, come on, populate. Like, let's do this again. All right. So I think you just made two good points. One, well, one good point about two different one. Okay. All of a sudden I had two good points and now I'm whittled down to just one. Okay, I guess I'll take it. It was one really good one, Matt. What you had was part of our thing is to expand maybe what's going to work for them and kind of open up the box. But I think what you then said was another part of our job as a salesperson is sometimes is to help narrow down this very wide range that they might be looking at, because that can be super confusing. Also, if we continue to use the aspect of cars, it's like, 
well, I like that car over there. I like that car over there too. Well, that one is a sports car and that's a pickup truck. What are we doing? Like, what is the end all goal? And for me, I like both. Like, that's a problem. I can walk into a lot and be like, well, I don't know. I kind of want both. Like, I see all the value in that one and I see all the value in that one. Well, we got a trailer in the back. We'll hook that up to the pickup truck and you can get out of here with both. You leave the lot with a pickup truck, a trailer, and a sports car. That's probably what would happen, right? Oh, that's exactly what would happen. (laughs) Putting that into the home's perspective as a buyer's agent too, like narrowing, be like, well, I don't need a narrow focus. The market already narrows it for me right now. It's like, that's not the point. The expanding and narrowing doesn't always have to do with the available inventory. It has to do with the way that we look at things to help somebody accomplish a goal. And so on the buy side, I feel like it's much more of a service, right? The listing side too, to win a listing. But when we get into actually what we sell, this is going to be fun. I think we've talked a lot about, I know we've talked a lot about being a great buyer's agent over the past couple of years, because if you run a great process, if you understand your clients, if you really showcase, hey, here's the service I'm going to come to you with, and we're going to bring exceptional negotiating skills and help you get these homes, you're going to do great. And we've seen it happen with ninjas all the time where, yeah, people are looking at two or three houses, they're writing a contract, and they're winning. And I know it doesn't happen all the time, but for the most part, if you're running a great process, you understand your value and your service as a buyer's agent, you're going to be able to perform and get, quote, sales done. Now, Garrett, on the listing side, because you brought this up like, oh, I need to launch listing again and everything. And this is, I feel like, a weakness that exists in the industry overall. Agents say all the time, I sell homes. And it's like, overall, how much time do you really spend selling homes? Not a lot, but this is your chance when you have a listing to sell. You now have a product that you are commissioned to sell. And now is your opportunity to make sure everybody knows how incredibly awesome that product is and match it up with the people who are looking for things while also identifying the features in the home that might be being overlooked that match with what somebody is looking for. So Gary, you're coming on the lot. Well, I'm looking for a sedan and all we got is SUVs. Okay, Gary, tell me why you're looking for a sedan. Why are you here today? So, well, I was thinking about this. Well, let me tell you about the sedan-like features of this SUV over here. Matt, you should go in car sales. Maybe I will. Maybe that's the next step. Maybe that's the next, no. This is your chance as a listing agent like to call other brokers to go out and not just put it on the MLS and just, well, the buyers are there. They'll come and see it. That Matt right there, like the amount of sales that a lot of listing, and there's a lot of listing agents out there right now that are gripping their steering wheel and swearing at me. But there are a lot of listing agents out there that that is the extent of sales they do for the property. They take photos, they have it staged maybe, and they blast it on the MLS. And they go, okay, come on, let's bring in the clients. Yeah. And you have to decide what do you want to be? Do you want to be a marketer or do you want to be a salesperson? Because a marketer will just market. They'll come up with ways to try to create conversion and good copy and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, like they're not really concerned. I mean, they want conversion because that helps them attract new clients. But ultimately, they're just focused on making sure the marketing is really good. The salesperson closes the sale. Here's the importance of what we're talking about right now. And this is why this is so important for all of you to be actually paying attention to. In the marketplace that seems to be on the horizon right now, where you are going to be up against other inventory and there is going to be a lot of homes that people can pick from and choices that can be made. If you are truly being a salesperson for your people, you can't just put it on the MLS. You can't just take good photos. There are conversations like I remember, I hope this comes back around because it was a fun, fabulous day also. But my office back when I was selling them, we had some crazy, I'm going to say 20 to, I remember we had taught that like 34 months of inventory. Like that's a lot of homes that we had to pick from. The market was in all aspects flooded. You had to get up and like showcase a property. You had to stand in front of all your realtors and entice them to come out to that house so you could walk them through and be like, let me show you the amazing aspects of what this house is and make a case for it that made the others go, I got buyers, I'm going to bring them in here later. They need to see this house. Because of your sales job you did to showcase what this property is and the attributes of what it has to offer. We haven't had to do that in a while. 
No. And I think the people who have been doing that even through the past couple of years have seen greater success than others. You can never compare, right? Because no one piece of real estate is the same as another. So hindsight doesn't even really exist in some cases because you can't go back and be like, well, let's just do this again to see what would have happened if we sold it a different way or if we targeted a different buying pool. And so the skill sets that I see, and, and there's a lot, like being a really good product salesperson, it takes some skills. It takes some training. Everybody can do it. It does not matter if you're introverted. And in fact, some of the most introverted people are some of the best salespeople because they can actually focus better on the product than showcasing what it is. And they have better empathy to listen to the buyer so they understand if they're in a selling situation that's just not going to go anywhere. Because remember what we said before too, Garrett and everybody listening, is that selling isn't the hardcore, pushy, fitting a square peg into a round hole and just driving a sale. It's understanding how to make everything work for everybody and getting to a solution. So I see a couple of things that you need to understand as a strong listing sales person is the product and the products you're competing against. What are the unique features that this product has that the others don't? So that when we go out to the market, we can understand, okay, if there are buyers looking for this, I know this is what we can lean them into. If it's a pool, we're the only property on the market with a pool. Yeah, but this one has this, this, and this. There's buyers out there who want a pool, right? We're going to highlight that. We're going to drive that home. We're going to drive that feature so hard because if we find that buyer that really wants a pool, done. Sale made. None of the other products have that. Well, I think this also goes back to like as a listing agent is really understanding who is the profile buyer for this property and being able to go and market specifically in those directions of who is the profile buyer. A lot of times we get caught up in bedrooms and bathrooms and lot size and it's like, oh, we, we have a four bedroom, three bath house on this much you know, yard in this section of neighborhood. But when you really break it down, it's like, but who is the real buyer for that house? It might be a family, you know, up front that house looks like, oh, this is a family style home. That's what this is going to be for the average person. But it might not be. This might be a great retiree's house for the basically the layout and how it's set up. And maybe there's something, out, another value piece of that property that's like maybe a wood shop or a, something to keep time busy as you're retired. There might be a whole lot of aspects about this property that you could sit back and say, you know what, our profile buyer is this. And then once you figure out who your profile buyer is, then you have now something that when you're going to describe that property to somebody, it's not just bedrooms and bathrooms. When you're going to talk to other real estate agents, you can say, I've got the perfect family house. I have the perfect retiree type house. I have the perfect whatever stage you might be in, you know, new family, bachelor pad, figure out whatever that looks like. But you've got the profile broken down so you can now go out and sell to the right people rather than just throw it out there to the masses which is what the MLS is. MLS is just tossing out to the masses. Yeah, it, it really is. And then it's also doing the other actions that are associated with being a good salesperson, calling people, promoting. I mean, yes, that's half marketing, half sales, I'd say, but calling other brokers. Hey, just want to make you aware that this property is there. Hosting quality open houses, quality broker open houses. Same thing on the buy side too. Goes into haves and wants though, Matt. Like These are things that we have not done for a while. But there's many marketplaces I look back on where one of the best things I did when I was selling was you got on the phone and you talked to the other big agents in town and you said, I've got this property right now. We just brought it on. It's spectacular. Because if I let it just sit on the MLS, the chance of it just getting lost in the minutia of all of the properties, very easy. But all of a sudden, I just brought it to somebody's attention. Do you have any buyers looking for something like this? Let's talk about that. Picking up the phone is a great, great skill to master with the right people. Yeah. And not offloading that to text message or email or things like that. That's a weak sales move. The strong sales move is to pick up the phone. Be active. And when you're in sales mode, you want to be strong. The strong survive, so to speak. And on the buy side, I would say too, as a buyer's agent, when you're in your service mode for your clients, I guess I'll call it your sales mode is finding those opportunities and picking up the phone and making the strong move to find the inventory, to understand the inventory so that when you go into a property, you also know what you're walking into with your buyer. So you know the key points that are going to benefit your buyer. 
and the things that they're already going to be maybe distracted by or like, hey, it's not red. I know it's not red, but it has this, this, and this, and these are the things. And can you picture this? Garrett, it's fun when you think about, we are salespeople by definition in real estate, and we try so hard to say we're not. Why? Let's embrace it and understand what really good sales is. It's, the problem is, is we immediately connotate it with the hard sale, the pushy sale. And we need to obviously disconnect that and focus on the low pressure and the relationship building and the solution. But that is good sales. The high pressure is bad sales. The solution is great sales. You need to see that there's two sides to the equation. And, and we, we, Matt, we watch it all the time where people come and a lot of people that are attracted to Ninja, they come in with this baggage of what a salesperson is. And the last thing I want to act like is a salesperson. I don't want my people to see me as a salesperson and I don't want them to feel like I'm selling them on stuff all the time. And, and I get it, but sometimes we run so far away that we end up leaving ourselves on an island going, well, at least I'm not a salesperson. And it really isn't an ugly word. If you're understanding what the definition of sales is and you're looking at it the right way, and this is why I like the trusted advisor. This is why I like the guide is really you're helping people make decisions. You're helping people move from one place to the next. Yeah. And we keep using this red car with cloth interior and a manual, but it, it's not forcing them to buy that car. It's not saying like, hey, you're leaving here, whether you like it or not with this vehicle. Which, by the way, there is sales like that. I've seen it, been around it. It's ugly. But seeing if there's maybe a solution that hasn't been proposed to you, or maybe there's a direction you haven't thought of. And that is a guide. That is looking at people's best interests and trying to figure out maybe there's something here that you just haven't been seeing, and maybe I can help you get there. So I know we've gone down a lot of different routes, Matt, today. Well, let me add one more thing too, Garrett. Of course. On the listing side, like if you're going for a listing, at first you have to sell yourself as the service, right? But they want a salesperson. A seller wants somebody who's going to sell their house. If I'm going to hire somebody to sell my house, I want somebody who's going to sell the you know what out of it. Yep. Because I want my house to be the best. Now, I need your help. And this is where the upfront of understanding your service first to help me sell so that I'm not also conflicted or have a fog as a seller of like, well, my house has maple cabinets and granite counters, so it must be better than everybody else's. And it's like, yeah, I know, Matt, so does everybody else's. And it's like, okay, you got to bring me down to earth so we position properly and present properly. But then now it's on you to go sell it. And a lot of agents get nervous about that. But if you embrace it, all of a sudden it's like, yeah. I'm going to go sell this house. I think as a, as a good salesperson like that, like you, you have to look at, again, not what the property is not. You have to look at what this property is and all the pieces that make it special, unique, stand out, and run with it and do the best you can to be able to showcase it. And again, there's a lot of factors that come into it because you can price it too high and all of a sudden, all those little cool factors that you're talking about don't mean a damn thing because it does not justify it by the price that you have put on it. It's a package that you're putting together and then bringing to people's attention so they can see what all's there. And I do want a salesperson. When I have somebody come and list my house for me, I want someone that's going to go there out there and sell the snot out of my house. I don't like the idea of like, well, 90% of people find their home through the MLS. Well, yeah, it's true. That's also because most homes are on the MLS. Yeah, Go and sell my house. I want to hear at the end of the day, like if you could report back to me saying, here's all the things we did to sell your house. And the competition, it's ripe for being able to provide like, hey, yeah, here's everything that we did. And you can blow a seller away with like, wow, you did all that. And it also will help validate if you need to go get a price adjustment, they're not going to be saying, well, what have you done? Then you point to your marketing, right? You're like, well, we've done all this marketing. Great. What have you done to sell? is what the sellers are really saying to you. And if you haven't done anything to sell, if you have not picked up the phone once, you're not in a good position to get their agreement and be on the same team to get a price adjustment if you need one. So do the things so that you have also market clarity on what's really going on. Because we've seen it all the time, Garrett. Listing expires, listings withdrawn, new agent comes in, same price, crushes it. Because that person was a salesperson. They sold that house versus marketed it. 
We've seen it a lot. If you go back, though, Matt, to the people that uh, there's a good, strong population of real estate agents out here right now that have not seen that yet. They have not been in a marketplace where there's a huge amount that are expiring and going back on the market. And I'm not predicting the future, but I am watching inventories grow right now. I am watching the games change a little bit. It's shifting around a little bit. Does your word shift? Shift. Oh, it's not that bad. I'm going to just have to resign myself and accept the shift because I hear it every single day, as I'm sure everybody else does. And it's how long do we have to hear that word before it's like, how long does a shift take? Because we're like two months of this now. It'll happen until somebody says the market has made an adjustment. We just use different words for the direction that we're going. It's like right now it's a shift, but prior to this, it wasn't a shift. Like, wait, so that outrageous appreciation we just had over the last couple of years, that wasn't a shift? That was just, that was the depreciation. Now we're seeing a shift. Then it's going to be the adjustment. You're right. I do go back. You'll hear things like Matt, like, well, when the market returns to normal or whatnot, and I do want people to look at the marketplace we're going into right now and the things that I'm watching happen. We've never seen a market like this before. There's elements of it that we've seen before, but there's also elements in the world and things going on that we've never seen before. There is no normal marketplace. There's just variations of some things we've seen in the past and new things that we've never seen before. And this is your new stage that you're working on. Which is why it's important to focus on these skills and make sure you have these skills because in any market, they will be extremely valuable. So with that being said, Matt, thank you for this today. Thanks for uh, rolling down this topic with me. For some reason, I felt like it was necessary, but I, I think it, it served its purpose and point. Along those lines, everybody who's listening, if you want to go jump on and check us out on Facebook, you can join the community that we're in. As Matt said, we have a lot of people on there who don't fill out their questions, which makes it hard for us to do anything with. I think there's 800 people on there who have not filled out questions, which I'm kind of getting ready just to delete all of them. Like It's like having an inbox that like things are piling up in. Yeah, you're going to have to start over again. I'm like, just boom, I, I'm sending you away. You're going to have to come back because it's just this big unmanageable list of people we're not going to accept in. So very close to doing that. If you're all of a sudden like, well, I did. Yeah, we erased you in a nice way. <laughs> well, maybe that'll be what's needed to help them take the next step, perhaps. And with that being said, if you want to know more about installations and ninja selling, there's great opportunities to take installations. There's more and more dates showing up. I was just talking with ninja selling yesterday, and they were telling me about future dates, that they have classes that are going to be being announced and bigger venues. And I'm very excited that there's going to be opportunities like that. So go to ninjaselling.com. Keep your eyes out there for upcoming events if you want to attend a ninja installation. If you want to know about more about coaching, and how we help people with coaching and help build the business that they've dreamed about, but haven't been able to achieve yet, please come see us on the Ninja Selling site also at Ninja Coaching. We're here to help. We've got a great group of coaches. And uh, I just appreciate everybody. Appreciate all you out there. And Matt, thank you. Thank you, Garrett, too. And thanks, everyone. Have an amazing day. If you enjoyed today's episode and would like more, visit us at the ninjasellingpodcast.com. There you will also find links for more information about Ninja Selling and coaching. Have an incredible day.